OK， 那我们就开始。所以，所以假设 H 是 w i g g l e r matrix， 就是它是等于呃 H I J， 然后 expectation。我假设这个，嗯，我是讲，我现在都是谈 real 的 case，complex 也是一样，然后 c o n t a i n e r 其实也是一样，但是主要主要是做 real， 嗯，那我们假设，呃、嗯，假设这个 H I J， 嗯 ，exponential counts H I J。expectation 是小于无限大，呃 ，times 呃 ，square root。嗯，我们会修了 exponential square root n h i j is less infinity。So in other words, this this h i j um h i j has uh, roughly speaking, you want to think about the H is uh, um, one over square root n of uh, of x i j, and this x i j expectation equals zero, and the mean um, variance equal to one, and uh, the probability distribution. Of x i j has uh, exponential tail. And this condition is not important. This actually is not important, but I just assume this uh, uh, for simplicity. So I'll, I'll, I'll comment later on. Okay. Now, the main theorem. It's the following. So, uh, I also should recall the definition of uh, uh, the k point correlation functions at uh, xk. Um, let me check what's my notation. Yes. Okay, so the k point correlation function is defined to be. Uh, Integration of n point correlation function uh, n of lambda one um, x one x k and y k plus one y n and where probability p n of lambda one to lambda n is the probability density of the eigenvalues um, is the probability induced by a law of H n. Actually, it's this one. So you you have, you have a matrix, and uh, so from this matrix, you can solve the eigenvalues equations. You get eigenvalues. So eigenvalue has a density. This is called a Pn lambda one to lambda n. So I remind you that uh, there's no explicit formula. For P1, what is Pn? Except, except the Gaussian case. And in this case, the Gaussian case, in this case, is the GOE. It's Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. Um, now, so this, and, and last time, 
in this special case, the Gaussian case, we know this one is given by orthogonal polynomials. And, but but I will not, I'm not going to repeat this. And so now, so the main difficulty here is, uh, is this one has no explicit formula. And then I should add a remark that uh, uh, I also consider this Pn, now Pn lambda 1 to lambda n. Uh, you can view this as in two ways. One is uh, if you think about lambda 1 less than lambda 2, less than lambda n. And uh, because you can order the eigenvalues, or you can also symmetrize it. Symmetrize it means uh, in the beginning you just define this over this, uh, you know, over this simplex. But then you can define everywhere by symmetrizing. So in this definition, this one, this is symmetric version. Because otherwise, uh, otherwise you have to, this, this one to k is not the first k eigenvalue, it's, it's actually arbitrary. So this is, this is called a k point, k point correlation function. In probability theory, it's called a k, k point marginal. So the main theorem is, uh, is uh, if you can compute, a, take n here. Oh, sorry, we should keep an n here. Then you take k point correlation functions. And now you fix energy E and plus alpha 1 divided by n. Uh, so, semicircle. Alpha k, n times zero semicircle of E. And you take the same thing with respect to pkn, but you put a Gaussian case and do the same thing here. And this object will converge. You take a test functions of alpha 1 to alpha k, you integrate over the alpha k. And then I need uh, a small average, actually. I need, uh, uh, let me see. Oh, I should put a v, sorry. Um, excuse me. V here. Oh, OK. Sorry, just a second. And now F, I integrate over V. And E minus B, and E plus B, 1 over 2B. OK, so I take limit. I will explain what's B angle to infinity. This actually is zero. And B is, uh, what is B? B is uh, bigger than, for any B, for any B less than uh, n to the minus 1 half. Oh, yeah, this is V. That's right. So, what's the idea? The idea is that if you take a k point correlation function and a scale 1 over n, here you divide by 1 over n. You should be careful because, uh, well, let me remind you. So, the, this, uh, the probability density. Uh, it's the probability density for, for H in. In other words, um, so the S, this one is equal to 1 over 2 pi square root, uh, square root uh, 4 minus x squared times currency functions.
So the semicircular law is the probability density of eigenvalues. Four. In other words, there is a semicircle, and then there will be more eigenvalue in the middle, and there will be less here, and actually, eventually, there's nothing outside. So, so this is probably this. So be careful, they are, they are all together n eigenvalues. So this is last time we proved this. This is the Wigner theorem. This is the Wigner theorem. Okay. So, and now if you want to understand the behavior of a local structure, so your correlation functions, you have to look at the correlation function at the scale one over n. So what we say is, uh, if you look at correlation fun function at the scale one over n. Then this one will converge weakly to a Gaussian case. And now, so converge weakly be because you, you do a test function. So this is test function. This is smooth functions with compact support. So you take smooth function with compact support. You take any matrix and you subtract the same thing in the Gaussian case. And then you say you take a test function, your average is going to zero. But on the other hand, uh, the theorem is, uh, is not, is slightly uh, weaker. It's uh, in the sense that this statement, what I'm hoping for, is, is not quite correct. You had, well, it's not quite, I mean, we didn't quite prove that. What we prove is that if you, in addition, if you take an average over energy E in a small window of size B, and this window size B is less than n to the minus one, half plus epsilon, then the statement is correct. Okay. And uh, um, so, so this, uh, I, oh, I forgot to say this, this E, and this also E, for any E belong to the interval minus two to two. Okay, so you had to be, this theorem is correct in the, in the, in the interior. Now, let me try to make some remark. Remark one is, uh, so there is, a, there is a similar theorem. Near the edges. In other words, this, this theorem also correct for the largest eigenvalues or the smallest eigenvalues. And that's the so-called tracy Whedon distribution which give you the, so it's giving the Tracy Whedon distribution. Okay. The second remark, uh, maybe I should write here. So the second remark is uh, uh, we only need the, uh, so we only need expectation x i j to the four plus epsilon. So that's infinity. So this is sufficient. So you don't really need the exponential decay. Uh, exponential decay is only for convenience. Actually, you can go down to this. But the conjecture is. Uh, it's only the second moment matter. If you have this, it's enough. So this is, this is open, actually. I think this may be doable. Actually, this problem may be doable, but it's a bit technical. So I don't really like it, but. Um, so, and remark three is, uh, is this uh, B can be, can be improved to uh, improved to replaced by without much it's uh, with similar idea so this means uh, you can actually you can almost take out this 
You can almost take out this average. Because once you go down to n to the minus 1, then actually you already look at a scale, a local scale. But with similar idea, you can go down to n to the minus 1 plus epsilon. Of course, every time I write this, is uh, epsilon has to be positive. And number four is uh, um, number four is um, it's actually the average in B can be totally removed. Um, so this is a major major work. So this needs uh, the major new idea. Okay. Uh, in the complex, in the in the in the real symmetric case. Now, for complex case, for complex case, the Hermitian case, uh, this follow form there's a formula. There's a formula called Itzixen. Itzix. You know, don't don't trust me with the spelling. It's six in Uber. Uh, it's six in Uber. I forgot. There's, there are lots of names. Uh, six in Uber. And uh, there, there are another two or three men, uh, three names. And then it's also called Harry Shandra. Harry. Uh, formula. This is something very strange. Um, the random matrix, all the random matrix theory in beta equal to 2, this complex case, is always, uh, it's always the simplest case. And then, uh, and that's because there's uh, this explicit formula. This explicit formula, is, it holds only for complex, it holds only for the uh, in the case of complex, um, it's actually only for the, the, the unitary group, but the, it does not hold for the orthogonal group. I don't know why. And actually, I, I don't really understand this formula. It's just, uh, just somebody said it's a formula, and so I can't. Um, but on the other hand, this formula, the people has never been able to do this in the, in the real case. I think in the real case, I think the, it's probably there's a formula, but it's so complicated, and it's a uh, um, it's very difficult to use. So, so what we are doing is uh, what we are doing here. We didn't use the these uh, explicit formulas. So, and then uh, make remark number five is uh, it's actually this x i j square. If you write this equal to s i j, then uh, then s i j can be very general. So this, I, I would not say any of this. Uh, so I try to, try to sketch a proof of the theorem in this form today. And, uh, and none of this, I would not say any of this extension today. And, um, I think this what it, it's a bit long story. So. So now let's go back to the, the technical part, and which is the consider this uh, Stigio transform. So any questions? And uh, anyone? What? Well, if if you take a of course, the, the correct statement, what you want to do is, uh, is without this average. You want to say this is, is correct for fixed V. But because, because mathematically, you cannot do this for a fixed point. 
then you do a small average. And so, so there's no importance. The importance is you can't do the case without it. And actually, it took another, I think this theorem was proved in the 2009 to 2010. And, uh, and this one, in the case we took out this, uh, can be totally removed. This is just a preprint. It's still not published yet. It's, uh, so, so there's, uh, you know, in mathematics, if you uh, if you ask uh, some very technical question, very uh, very fine detail, then it's very hard to do. And um, and now, if you ask me whether whether it's important to remove the average, I mean, depending on what you mean, it's. Uh, I think physically, of course, you don't believe that they. they <laughs> You don't believe any weak convergence is really weak. It's not strong. But on the other hand, in mathematics, you can ask some very specific question. You cannot answer with a theorem with an average. So you have to, so technically, you have to remove it. And so, and by the way, uh, the, the statement of this theorem has to be take weak convergence. Because in the discrete case of Bernoulli random matrices, this is just plus minus one, for example. Then, then if you don't test this with a smooth function, then the theorem is not even correct. And so, okay. So now, uh, so now I will sketch the. So now let's go back to the Stiegel transform. Oh, remark three is uh, here. I state this is b to minus one half plus epsilon. That's what. One half is uh, it, the the s the smaller the b, the better. The smaller the average, the stronger the theorem. The, second, the first condition is more freedom. But you take a more average. Your statement. Your statement. You want to prove that this is correct for fixed v. You want to prove this without the average. This is the the best statement. And the, yes, but the average over smaller windows. Well, this theorem is correct only if you take the b. Well, maybe only, only if you take a b n. B is a b is a number depending on n, and this number has to be less than n to the minus one half plus epsilon. I mean, this of course this is this is a this. If we are replaced b by this, this is a stronger. This is a stronger result. Which of course will not follow from the theorem. Will not follow from the theorem as I stated here. But what I'm saying is, uh, you actually can prove this theorem also under this condition, under this as, uh, assumption without changing very much the structure. So. So this theorem is almost correct. Uh, this theorem is correct, actually, if you change this n minus 1 half to n minus 1. And the proof is only small changes. I don't understand the logic. I don't understand your logic either. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you, you, your, your theorem says, uh, I take a windows. I need to average b to I need to average n to the minus 1 half plus epsilon. Then it's correct. Another theorem says uh, I average over a window of a size n to the minus 1 plus epsilon. Then this is correct. Oh, bigger than, bigger than. Thank you. Sorry. Oh. OK. Thanks. So this is what I mean. Yes. You mean why there's a difference? Oh, um, sorry. Uh, 
So, so this is the following. Sorry. Um, now, the the problem is the following. So the question is, if you take a metric A plus B, and B is any fixed matrix, it doesn't matter what it is. Okay. And A is uh, a is uh, Gaussian. A is GUE. Okay. And then you look at eigenvalue distribution lambda one to lambda n of A plus B. So, so there's explicit. So there's a formula. There's a formula. Give you explicit expression of this A plus B. And this formula is not correct if I replace this GUE by GOE. And uh, you will see that later on, it's very important to consider perturbation of a matrix by a Gaussian matrix. So, so study matrix of this type. So, so study matrix of this type is important for, for, uh, for proving this theorem. This theorem, this theorem will be proved I mean, if you think about this B is H. You take your original metric H. You add the perturbation. This is something you add. You add the perturbation. In the complex case, you add the GUE. In the real case, you add GOE. And then from this ex explicit, explicit formula, you find that H plus A has uh, uh, satisfied the theorem. And then finally, you should try to remove this perturbation and then say H satisfied that result. So in this procedure, it's very important to understand the matrix eigenvalue for this one. And in the complex case, there's explicit formula given by this six and Ruber Harishanja formula. And in the case, if this A is GOE, if this A is GOE, if this one is GOE, there is no such formula. And if somebody can find the explicit formula in the case of GOE, then, then everything we did, uh, you can remove it. And actually, as you said, that uh, uh, there are some sort of formula people has for the for a real case, but it's so complicated, it's not even know what to uh, what to use. And also, even the the this symmetric case, this formula actually is not that easy. But actually, but you know, it's not easy, but it's actually fairly. Uh, it's very usable. So, but I cannot explain this to um, because I don't really understand this um, why this D group uh, in, in the special case of, of unitary case has a, such a special formula. This I don't understand, and, and I don't I don't think anybody really understand it. because if, if you really understand, then you understand why this is correct in, in the case of complex but not real. But but the, I look at the literature. Every paper just says, uh, just says nobody knows how to do for the for the GOE case. What? Sorry. What's the main tool? What's the main tool? Well, it, it's <laughs> I I I don't know either. This uh, Harry Shanja formula, it's. Uh, it's uh, it, it, it's a among the group. All these eigenvalue has uh, has some special relations. I have no idea what they are, and so I don't really know. I mean, if you want to, I, I need to prepare this for a major lecture. It's it, it's more than you know. This is something um, I can't really say what it is. Um, I also don't know why it's correct. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, all right. So now we get to the uh, Steger transform. So uh, So Steger transform, uh, you define the, if you have a probability measure mu, mu is a probability measure. 
So it defines a steel chain for a mill at z is equal to z minus uh, oh uh, x minus z sorry x minus z uh, mu okay. all right so now you take the mu so if you take the mu uh, it's a summation of delta x minus lambda j j from one to n and one over n and then then this s uh, of mu of mu it's, you call this mn of z, it's just uh, 1 over n summation of j from 1 to n of uh, uh, lambda, j, uh, lambda j minus z mu, uh, oh, just this. Okay. And now, so this is equal to the trace of g of z, and g of z is 1 over z minus h and 1 over n. Okay. So and then so this is well known that so this is a fact. You define the MSC of z is equal to rho SC of x dx of x minus z. Then MSC of z plus 1 over msc of z plus z plus 0. Okay. Um, two? Yes. Wow. Okay. okay. Um, and then you can solve this expression. So, so I'll, I'll, wow. So let me just write it. Okay, so now our idea, so, so this is the fact. Now I write the z equal to e plus i eta. So the fact is uh, if you compute mn of z minus msc of z, limit as n goes to infinity, this will equal zero for any Data fixed. This this is more or less due to the Wigner theorem. And this goes to zero with high well, with high probability. Actually we didn't really say what is mean by high probability. So, so I will make this precise later on. So the Wigner theorem you can restate it by saying that the uh, the steel transform minus this one, same as circle one goes to zero, and uh, uh, with eta fixed. And now our goal is uh, we want to study this this same thing. For eta equal to n to the minus 1 plus epsilon. So this is uh, the main, main task. And now the question is why? So the so reason is the following. The reason I think I, I mentioned last time this, uh, this function, lambda j minus z, okay, let me try x, is equal to x minus e square plus eta square. If you look at the imaginary part, it's equal to that. So this is, uh, this at point E, it's a, and then the size here is eta, and the height is eta minus one, okay? So, um, so this, uh, so this means uh, the smaller a, the smaller the eta, the more the more precision, more information I have in understanding the original structure of this lambda J M I C. So that's a key, the key idea. Is, and so, 
So roughly speaking, if you look at this uh, summation, j from 1 to n, uh, lambda j minus z divided by 1 over n. This, roughly speaking, is a number of eigenvalues uh, in, in E minus eta and E plus eta divided by n. Uh, because you, the, the imaginary part of this is roughly this. Do we agree? Yes or not? I mean, this is, this, uh, uh, you have to agree that what we are trying to study, I mean, never mind the proof, but uh, just, uh, this was, uh, maybe I should tell you this, well, why are we trying? You know, this was the first question I, I asked when I uh, go into this field. It's, uh, so now, if you look at green functions, the green function, roughly speaking, if you take lambda j minus z, it really just because each one, the imaginary power of this one is x minus e plus eta. So this means you take an e and take a window eta, and out of this is eta minus one, so this is the density. Uh, if eigenvalues lambda j is here, then this lambda j, then this imaginary part of lambda j minus z is basically counted as eta minus one. If lambda j minus z is less than eta. So, so it's inside, you count as eta minus one, but outside you count very little, it's almost zero. So this one is really, you take an energy E and you fix a window size eta, and then you ask how many, how many eigenvalues are inside. So that's really what it meant. Okay. And so, uh, so if you count the number of eigenvalues inside here divided by n, um, actually divided by n eta, sorry. Divided by n eta. Uh, no, I think it's, it's actually divided divide by n eta because uh, this one, let me, let me write it again. X minus Z is equal to eta minus one if uh, X minus Z, X minus E is less than eta, okay? So if there's eigenvalues in this window, E minus eta, E plus eta, you count it as eta minus one. And then, a num and then here you sum over that, you divide one over N, divide by one over N is N eta, and the summation give you the number of eigenvalues here. So this is the quantity you want to study. So, so the basic message is, uh, if you want to understand the eigenvalue structures, you first has to, you look at the green functions, of this, and then you start to look at this eta become very smaller and smaller. And this is a key, key point. So, um, so I, I think, you know, I, I'm trying to explain to you that uh, w when we study when we started to do the random matrix, and uh, so there there was no uh, there was no no estimate on this green function except this Wigner theorem. So now the question is, uh, you you are trying to study don't don't forget you are trying to study this problem. In the beginning you are trying to study this problem, and so at the time most people just try to find the formula for this guy, and so that you can analyze. But on the other hand, we completely given up to study this problem. Instead, we look at the green functions. We look at the green function and we start to ask the question, when the green function, when this eta becomes smaller, can we get an estimate on this guy? So, so this is a standard approach into it. If you are, if you are analyst, you, you start to try to derive some sort of a priori estimate. You try to understand the question, uh, you try to understand the question, this eta is bigger than n to the minus one plus epsilon because you don't want to go to study the, the real detail of the, of, the, of the distance between two eigenvalues. You take a scale slightly bigger and you want to get some information. So this is the idea of once you, once you, you are trying to approach a problem by doing analysis, it's always 
you always try to derive some a priori estimate in this way. And so this was the first question we are asking, is try to see if we can uh, get, get an estimate like that. And the theorem is the following. So this is the theorem. So let me try to say this theorem is in, um, this is theorem 4.5 in my, in my low note. Okay. Theorem 4.5 says, uh, if you, if you compare G i g a of z, of course, you can also consider the, well, I, let me state the mn of z first. mn of z minus msc of z. This less than 1 over n eta times n to the epsilon. So the probability of this bigger than this is uh, less than n to the minus c for any c. And uh, now, and the, the z. I should give a domain of z. And z is, uh, uh, And Z is, uh, let me see, just a second. I should find the domain. Um, oh. And eta. Pointing. Now, uh, if you look at the, the note, it's, it's, it's stated slightly differently, and also including the edge. But here, I only talk about I only talk about the, the estimate. Uh, I did include a, what's the improvement near the edge. So, so this statement like this. Let me see. Yeah, that's right. That's correct. Oh, in that's right. Sorry. Thanks. So. And now, as a corollary, the corollary, we get the following theorem, which is, uh, uh, yeah. The theorem is, uh, oh, so this is theorem 4.5. This corollary, this is theorem 9.5. It says the following, so the probability, uh, so define gamma j to be equal by, by the equation j over n equal to minus infinity to gamma j, the semicircle of x dx. Okay, so this is the, so this is the, so gamma j is the classical location of J's eigenvalues under the law, low semicircle of X. So in other words, you take the semicircle law, and if you integrate up to here, and if this one give you j over n, and this point, you will call this point gamma j. So this is what you expect the location of j's eigenvalue is. Okay? And the theorem says, uh, 
uh, the probability of uh, uh, if there exists a J such that lambda J minus gamma J is bigger than J uh, minus one third n minus j minus two thirds and n to the epsilon is less than n to the minus d for only d. So now, um, so this is called a rigidity of eigenvalue. Uh, so let me explain what's uh, what's going on here. It's a what? Oh, why, why you have a one-third, two-third? OK. Yeah, this is what I'm trying to explain now. Uh, the region is the following. The region is, uh, if you look at this, now the typical spacing of eigenvalue here is n to the minus two-third near the edge. This is because the square root behavior here. And in the center, once you cross center, the typical distance is n to the minus 1. So, so once j equal to 1, actually I shouldn't write, once j equal to 1, you only get the n to the minus 2 third. So if you think about this, it's, uh, this is j for j less than n over 2. Because once j bigger than n over 2, then you should count it from this side. So I only wrote half of it. So what he says is uh, the typical eigenvalue space is n to the minus 2 third. And the typical eigenvalue space is n to the minus 1 here. And then if you start to look at your location of gamma j, this is uh, the prediction for the semicircle law. And then this is the real location of lambda j. Then their distance. Their distance, if you are in the bulk, the distance is, is basically n to the minus 1. Of the order n to the minus 1, you can make some error n to the epsilon, but that's it. So that's why it's called rigidity. It means, uh, it means that every single eigenvalues are pretty much located what it should be. I mean, if you, uh, if you compare with a Poisson distribution, this is completely different. Poisson distribution, you will not have, you will not prove any theorem like this. That's because uh, if you take n, n particle, go like a Poisson distribution, somewhere there's a big gap, and somewhere they are, they are very, very close. So this is uh, a completely different from the, from the Poisson. So this gives you the roughly where, the rough location of where the eigenvalue was is, and so that's the rigidity. And this rigidity, coming from uh, eigen, a green function estimate. You know, I was, uh, I was, uh, under, I always understand mathematics from the point of view of differential equation. So that's why I try to estimate the green functions. So to estimate green function is a nature, it's a nature direction, it's a nature method for me, but it's not necessarily nature for other people. So if you look at Terry Tao's approach, he didn't touch green function at all. He has no green function estimate completely, he's nothing. Because he's, he's looking at problems from, um, from this high dimensional geometry. And so, so from um, this more like this balance space uh, consideration, the high dimensional geometry. But, um, but I, think, I think in this problem, uh, the, the, this uh, look at problem from differential equation point of view still give you much, much stronger result. And so, OK, so uh, now. Uh, so let me, so I want to explain two things. One is, uh, oh, I should erase this. 
what is the, the first thing is, uh, why is this equation correct? Why is this equation? Of course, you can explain the solution, but why is this correct? And then uh, the second thing is, uh, when you get the green function estimate, how can you go from green function estimate to, uh, to a precise location of the eigenvalues? So, so this idea, to go from here to here, this is a, a very cute idea. Uh, it's not due to, me, due to us, but um, uh, I mean, the theorem is due to us, but the, but the two are not due to us. And it's also quite general, and it's, uh, it's very, um, it may be useful in, in other contexts. So this is very nice. And this one, this one is more, um, this one is a bit harder. So, um, so let me start with this. And then I will, I will explain a little bit of this one. And then I hope I can start the Dyson Brown in motion. Uh, so, okay, so I think, let, let me start with this guy. Okay. Now, I don't know if you, so for students learning the harmonic uh, function analysis, so let me ask you a question. How do you, suppose you have a metric H, a symmetric. All you can think about is the operator. You know, in the function analysis, more or less, it's, it, it's the same as linear algebra. It's just, uh, it just puts some topology. It's basically the same. So how do we define f of h? When h is, uh, uh, when h, um, f is, uh, say, some, some nice functions. So how do we define it? A diagonal of h, yes. And, uh, but actually, so this means you have to diagonalize this edge completely, right? But on the other hand, in most of the time, you cannot really diagonalize it. So what do you do? <laughs> so, uh, so, so, so of course you can you can diagonalize and define it using using eigenvalue eigenfunction. This is what you learn in the uh, in the spectral theorem. But but there is a way is uh, is to if you compare h minus z and f of z easy over the contour integration. Right. Then you can define it because you of course you need one over two pi high. And uh, so here our, our spectrum is here and then you take a contour in closeness, compute this, this exactly give you the f of h. So this is very nice. The only trouble is uh, it's actually this form is very difficult to use. And the reason is because uh, this is difficult to use is because uh, um, uh, it's difficult to use because this because it's a complex contour integral, so there are lots of cancellation and oscillation. So this formula is hard to use. But there's a there's a beautiful formula called the uh, let me try to try to find it. This formula, um, it's actually a bit unfair. It's called the Herfeld-Schwarzschild formula because I don't think they are the first. This formula is is, is well-known classical formula. Okay. So the formula is the following. The formula is f of h is equal to dz bar. And F tilde is uh, F tilde is called uh, um, I forgot his name. Uh, just a second. Uh, F tilde of X. Okay. 
and chi is the function. This is one half. It's one here. It's one. Then it's here. Okay. So this F2 that is called, uh, I forgot its name, it's something called the uh, uh, pseudo holomorphic extension, or I, I forgot, I forgot exactly. Mm. Pseudo analytic extension. Extension. Oh. And f is uh, f is uh, the original function f. It's f is, uh, is I think f is a C two function. I forgot exactly. I think C two is already enough. There's one derivative here, so so probably uh, one or two derivatives is already enough. So this formula, uh, you have this. So with this formula, this in private. You can compute summation f of lambda j, j from one to n, one over n, and this will equal to one over pi, and the d d z bar f tilde x plus i y, and divide by lambda j minus z. Uh, sorry, I write like this. This one over lambda j minus z, summation over j one over n, and uh, dx dy, and this one is one over pi of d z bar f tilde x plus i y of m n of z dx dy. So this is that's why the imp this importance is in this. So you get this formula. In other words, now you can take your function f. You can take your function f is a counting functions, like this in one and almost go down to zero. So you can take f like that. This is one and then it go down to zero. And there's energy e here. So you can count the number of eigenvalues here using this formula. So it, it tells you that from the from the Steele transform or from the Green function, you can you can give a precise. There's a very precise formula for for the eigenvalues. Uh, for a summation of eigenvalues, and from this formula, from this formula, then this formula is the key. Once you get that, you plug in that formula because what you say is uh, what you say is this this m n of z. Can be replaced by replaced by MSC of Z. So once you can replace this by this one, and then then this one will just count how many eigenvalues for the for the weak and the random matrix, and the, and if you use this one, you will count the eigenvalues given by the semicircle law, and so that's why you get a comparison. Uh, I, I hope it's the, it's the logic, okay? Uh, I mean, this formula, of course, one has to prove it, but uh, uh, actually, I, I strongly suggest that if you, if you took compare analysis, actually, if you know the calculus, know the green theorem, you can actually prove this directly. Don't, don't, you, can, you don't have to go to read any, uh, any paper or whatever. You just prove this by compare analysis. That's it. It's, uh, it's because even though I, I write the H here, but you can think about H is just a number. Because you, you want to prove the theorem, the only thing you need is because you can diagonalize, as you, as you say, you can diagonalize. So this formula, you only have to prove this for a number. So this H, you can think about this H is a number. This H is a number. So with this is a number, it's just something like a Koch integral formula. But instead of Koch integral formula, you are integral over a two-dimensional space. And then the, it's something quite similar to Koch integral formula. 
but it works for non-analytic function. First, this works for non-analytic function. And the second, this is two-dimensional integration, so the singularity is much weaker. The singularity here, H minus Z, become much weaker over two dimension. And previously, if you use this formula, you have, to wor you have to worry about because this is line integral. But if you take a line integral, then when H close to Z, this will be very singular. So this formula is always much better. It's almost always. Oh, you worry about I lose the company analysis, good probably company analysis. Uh, yes, this could happen. But, but I'm just telling you that in our experience, it's almost always better to use this one. There are, one, there are some rare occasion we use this one to give you a good result. But in most cases, this, uh, this one, this formula is better when you are doing analysis. But of course, if you, are, if you want to do lots of contour integral, you want to have explicit formula, the contour integral is always much better. But so. Stigio transform. Okay, so so I think uh, I think now is probably a good time to start. So let me just conclude what I'm saying. Uh, the, this always uh, is for the green function estimate. You can get the rigidity eigenvalues, and the rigidity eigenvalue, of course, is still far from what you want to do here. But it give you the, it give you a, a so, sort of the, a priori estimate what you need to do that theorem. So in next hour, I will start to uh, to explain what's this idea, and then I will introduce the Dyson Brownian motion. And uh, I don't know how much I can go, but I think I can define the Dyson Brownian motion and mention one key property. But I don't know if I can prove this theorem. So this will be okay. OK, so um, I think I, I will not, um, I don't think I have time to, to, to talk about this estimate. And also, uh, the idea, I can say that you know, I can say a few words about the history and so on. So the idea is, uh, so this estimate um, for eta bigger than n three minus 1 half plus epsilon. So this case can be done by was more or less proved. Uh, well, by, by a combination of um, uh, this, this, this work by Bai, Bai Zidong, and uh, and also. Uh, combination with Gearnet uh, um, and uh, uh, Zaituni. So this is estimated by um, the method is by concentration. So they are using the uh, concentration idea based on log sober inequality. And, uh, and, the, and the Bai is only, um, I think Bai has been spending his life to try to, try to improve uh, estimate on the, uh, on the Stiger, on the Stiger transform. But, uh, but somehow he, the idea and his approach was, uh, was much more convoluted. So he couldn't see the, uh, how to get eta become smaller. And so, And now, uh, 
So I, I, I will not talk about this because because this is going to uh, you know explain the idea will take about 20, 30 minutes. Is already so maybe I should tell you what's the the Tyson Brown emotion, which uh, which may have uh, some um, some more general appeal. Okay, so. So I start with uh, Dyson Brown emotion. Now Dyson, the Dyson Brown emotion idea is, is very easy. So you take a matrix H equal to one of square root n of X i is j. So now suppose this xij is xij of t, which is press brown emotion bij of t. And now, uh, oh no, I, I write, as I written it's a small bij. And bij, this is a standard brown emotion. Okay. And so now the question is. Uh, What is the, the dynamics? Of eigenvalue lambda one of T to lambda n of T. So this was uh, so this was a question of uh, um, of Dyson, and uh, the statement is the following. The statement is. Uh, if you look at the, the stochastic dynamics, then it's equal to uh, square root two So this, so the theorem is the following. So the eigenvalues satisfy this dynamics, and this is by Dyson. I think Dyson proved this in the, about 1960. So uh, now, uh, so so the question is, how do you derive this form? Uh, how do you derive this? So the question one is, uh, how was the derivation? Uh, so the idea, uh, so let me try to explain to you the, the idea, how to derive this formula. Um, the idea is the following. So, so if you look at the eigenvalue equations of H of U alpha, U lambda alpha, U alpha, this actually is uh, if you, if you take if you took quantum mechanics class, and uh, you know the second order perturbation formula and plus Ito formulas, so plus Ito's formula, then then you get this formula. So the proof, roughly speaking, the proof is uh, is by perturbation. And the uh, Ito's formula. So I'll explain what's the, what's the perturbation means. So if you look at the equation like this, this eigenvalue equation, and everybody has a T dependence. Okay. Now you take the derivative in T. So this implies H dot U alpha plus H U alpha dot equal to lambda dot plus lambda u alpha dot, okay? So this is obvious, it's correct. And now, you multiply this equation by u beta. So you get u beta h dot u alpha plus u beta dot h.
equal to uh, lambda dot because the u uh, actually this term is zero because the beta now equal to alpha and alpha and beta are orthogonal and then you press lambda plus u alpha dot u beta so get this equation equation one and uh, equation two equation two is uh, you uh, you multiply this this is beta now equal to alpha You can also take beta equal to alpha. When you take beta equal to alpha, this beta equal to alpha, this is u alpha, h dot u alpha. And plus, uh, this term, when alpha equal to beta, um, this, this is u alpha h beta, so this is lambda alpha, u alpha, u alpha dot equal to, now on the right hand side is lambda dot, because u alpha squared equal to 1, and plus lambda uh, u alpha, u alpha dot. Okay. So these two equations. Uh, am I correct? So I multiply u alpha, so let's write. Uh, Mm, u beta, this one, this means you go that, so that's correct. And, uh, and then lambda alpha dot, yes. So this term is zero, and this term is zero. That's right. Yeah, okay. So this term is zero because uh, you normalize your equation u alpha u alpha. This is equal to one. So you take a derivative. This is equal to zero. So you can solve you you can solve it lambda dot. And then from here you can also solve the u dot. Okay. So f so you get lambda dot formula, and you also get u dot. Alpha. There's also a formula just from here. Uh, this formula says uh, if you compute h u alpha dot and they acting on u beta, you can compute. So in terms of h dot, so this means uh, this component because then you take an inverse. Um, so what should I say? I think maybe okay. Let me try to explain this in, in slightly nicer way. So look at this formula. Okay, now you know what you know what's lambda dot because lambda dot is given by this form. So from here, you can get u uh, h uh, h minus equal to So this imply uh, you have a dot. So you can compute this, okay? So you have a formula for the derivative of eigenvector and derivative of eigenvalues. And this formula is called a this formula, lambda, this is called the first order perturbation formula. And this one is called the second order. Okay. Uh, this is a standard. You know, the physicists spend their life using perturbation formula, but this is not very popular in mathematics. And, and the reason is. Uh, one key reason is because, uh, uh, because I mean, if you written this as a derivative, it's, it's rigorous. But otherwise, uh, the physicists always apply this to a, a perturbation. So when whenever you change h by something very large, so the perturbation in mathematics is difficult to justify. But anyway, it's, it's extremely useful, and for some reason, it's just not very well known in mathematics. 
But anyway, so, so here, is, here is completely rigorous because, uh, because it's just derivative. And so, so now you want to compute d lambda alpha. So if you, according to Ito's formula, um, so you compute a, you can d square, uh, d square lambda alpha, and d uh, h i k d h uh, l j, and then plus, plus d lambda alpha d h i k and uh, d h i k. And this one, um, so, and then, um, so at the end, so I, I will not do this, uh, so this is quadratic variation. So at the end, so I will not follow through this calculation because using this, this perturbation formula because you can compute lambda dot and you have a dot. At the end, you will, you will find out, I mean this is some calculation, you'll find it's one over square root of n, summation i k, uh, u alpha i, u alpha k, d, uh, d b i k minus plus one over n summation lambda alpha minus lambda beta, beta equal to alpha dt. So you get this formula. Uh, so, the, so all I'm saying is, I think this is probably hard for you to follow exactly this calculation. But all I'm saying is, uh, this actually is in page, uh, page 65 and 66. 65 to 66. But these calculations, uh, if you know the Ito's formula, and then you apply Ito's formula, you find that you compute the first derivative of lambda, and you also compute the second derivative of lambda. But the second derivative of lambda is connected to the derivative of eigenvector. So, so this one can be computed using, using this information because uh, you can see that the lambda dot depends on u alpha. So you take second derivative would depend on u alpha dot. So, so the, the derivative here will depend on u alpha dot, and then you use the second order formula. You put it together, and then at the end, you get this formula. So this is uh, you know, a slightly long calculation, but uh, it's basically just one, it's just one page calculation. Another idea is, uh, is this guy, uh, this guy. So, it, so you let, um, so you define, so you redefine this B alpha, uh, this is DB alpha equal to um, summation I K U alpha I and U alpha K DB I K. Okay? And then you can check that uh, DB alpha, DB beta, this quadratic variation is uh, equal to delta alpha beta and and so so this means uh, so this implies the b alpha is a standard brown motion okay so that's the idea uh, i mean rigorous proof is a, a small um, has some small small different small details but uh, roughly speaking this is the idea so you get this, uh, you see, what oh, I'm trying to emphasize is uh, the Brownian motion of the alpha's eigenvalue comes out is because this, uh, this, this linear combination of summation of IK, of dBIK and with these eigenvectors. So you all this put together, you call this uh, a new Brownian motions. Then you check the new Brownian motion has this quadratic variation of the standard Brownian motion. So this means that these are independent Brownian motions. So that's the idea. I mean, it's not, it's, it's, it's not you, after you, I mean, you may, I don't know if you feel that uh, whether there's uh, uh, 
there's some curiosity because this d lambda i, this d b i, so this is the, and then you can ask where this Brownian motion come from, because in the beginning here, your Brownian motion of i j, but it only has one of, these are n square of them, these are n of them. And the connection is, uh, this Brownian motion is actually given by this formula, okay. So, so my suggestion is uh, you, you probably don't want to uh, worry too much these derivations. And you should take this uh, for granted, this, that this, there's such a formula for the dynamics of the eigenvalues, okay? Now, uh, so, I, so, so let me add some small remark. It's, uh, so you can also consider dHIJ is, uh, uh, is equal to dBIJ minus one half HIJ over two uh, of dT. Let me check it's over two or I think it's over two. So this is so-called, uh, uh, yes, this is the einstein uhrenberg process. If you take this einstein uhrenberg So this will tell you that d under i will be almost the same, 1 over square root 2 over n, d b i uh, plus minus lambda i over 2 plus summation 1 over n, lambda j, let me see, lambda j minus lambda, lambda i minus lambda j. Okay. So, uh, so this is the, you actually you add this term. The only difference is you add this term. Okay. Now, uh, for, for stochastic process, so define the L, this is the generator to the SDE. So this L becomes uh, uh, 2 over n, d squared, d lambda i squared, plus, and this term becomes minus lambda i over 2, plus 1 over n, summation over j, and d, d lambda i. Okay. So this is the generator of the dynamics, and the meaning of the generator is that if, if you start from a process f of 0, lambda 1 to lambda n of, um, um, oh, sorry, sorry, I should, I should add one more thing, so. So this L is a symmetric, is a symmetric operator with respect to e to the minus n times h, well, times summation. So let me write this more precisely, this is uh, e to the minus n of uh, uh, Hamiltonian of lambda. And then this uh, Hamiltonian of lambda is a summation of lambda j over square over, I think it's over four, over four over two. Ah, uh, okay, I don't quite remember as well. And uh, plus, um, just a second, minus or plus. Uh, let, me, let me find it. I forgot the sign. Um, yeah, here, okay. So minus one over n. Summation log lambda j minus lambda i. And summation of uh, j bigger than i. Okay. Um, okay, so. So when I say L is symmetric with respect to this, this means uh, uh, this is called measure d mu, and this means uh, L acting on f and g d mu is equal to L g f d mu. Okay. And so, so then the, the standard notation, then you call it f, L f. This is called this is called the rich form, and this one is uh, uh, okay. So one over n 
this actually in our case is equal to 1 over n. Um, it's a 1 over 2 n times uh, integration of d i f square summation of i d mu. So I don't know if this makes you feel better, but this is actually equal to if it gradient f. Okay. Now, um, <coughs> so oh, summation of i summation. Now. Um, now from the from the SDE to this operator, this is a standard in probability theory. You, you take uh, you take the coefficient of this guy square, and you change this to the derivative square, and the, this one just becomes this one times dd lambda i. So that's the the standard uh, stochastic calculus. It's uh, once you get that, you can get down to here. Okay. Uh, it was. If you look at Dyson's, the Dyson's paper is very interesting. The Dyson, I don't understand physicists. Physicists seems to be born uh, in a completely different way. And uh, physicists, Dyson didn't use Ito calculus because, but somehow he can, he can, he, he, he liked to use the derivative of white noise. I don't know how to make that rigorous, but uh, anyway, that's his calculation. And then he did the same thing, but the end he came up with the same formula. And so, uh, but it's much, uh, Nowadays, it's much, much cleaner to look at Ito's formula and get this formula. Okay, now, the, so once you get that, and then, uh, so Tyson basically stop, stop here. He, he never wanted to look at it from this way, but if you are trained uh, in the probability, you immediately will write in this way. And, uh, now, what's the surprise is, uh, the surprise is that eigen, the eigenvalues equation is autonomous. Autonomer. Oh, I, I don't know how to say how to spell it. So, so the eigenvalue has an equation by itself. It does not involve eigenvector. In principle, the eigenvalue and eigenvector equation can couple. But here, you only you see the eigenvalue by itself. The eigenvector can really disappear. So, so my advice. Okay. So, so for those of you who do not know the stochastic characters. My suggestion is the following. So you just, just forget about what the deep Brownian motion means. You just think about the, the metric elements go by a diffusion, pro by, a, by a heat equation. If the metric element uh, go by heat equation, then the eigenvalue will satisfy an equation with this generator L. And more precisely, more precisely is the following. It's a, more precisely is a if, if ft of lambda 1 to lambda n d mu lambda is the probability distribution at time t, then then dt Ft is equal to L. Ft. <coughs> so meaning is the following. So if you want to understand the eigenvalue distributions uh, at time t, what you do is uh, you solve this equation. You solve this equation, and then you take Ft d mu. Then this will be your probability density at time t of the uh, of the eigenvalue distribution. So you can complete it. Yes. Oh, uh, that's a good question. This is, actually, this is the key. The key is to study this equation. Because from there you have a Yeah, but that's not, uh, yes. Uh, that, that this is actually the, the key, of, the key is to analyze this equation, and the, the spectral gap and so on will not be sufficient. And this is what I'm trying to say. Uh, so, so the question is, uh, of course, now this is the equation, but, 
So this is this equation with n particles. And uh, a typical equation with n particles is not that easy to understand uh, what's going on. And so, so Tyson just uh, so Tyson just write down the equation, and uh, he start to guess what's the behavior of this equation, and so, so here is uh, Tyson's conjecture. Tyson's conjecture of the following: <coughs> It's very strange. Tyson says uh, the local, the time to local equilibrium. for this dynamic star. For, uh, let's just call it DBM. Is of order. By the way. Okay. This is a very vague conjecture. It's, uh, he, he didn't make it precise what's the meaning of this. Because uh, <coughs> the trouble is, you don't know what's the, you, you, don't, you have to first say what the local equilibrium means in order to, to say this statement. And so, <coughs> uh, and I think what I'm trying to tell you is, uh, uh, this all is, uh, I will try to show, tell you the idea to prove that this is correct. And so, so they would. And now, um, so for those of you doing differential geometry, you actually, it's actually this operator, it's, it's almost like uh, Laplace operator on the manifold. It's, it's, uh, it's actually any 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 operator of this type you, you can study just like uh, like a Laplace operator on the manifold, except the manifold now is changing uh, with this quadratic form. Okay. And now, so from now on, I will forget about um, I will forget about everything about. Um, <coughs> so just forget about everything about this derivation of the Eto's formula and so on. It just just think about you want to study this PDE. It's a linear. This is a linear PDE. Okay. All right. So, uh, uh, so let me define what's the entropy. So if you, the entropy of a two probability measure is defined to be uh, well, log of uh, times okay so this is uh, how I define the entropy and then if you write the mu if you write the uh, uh, okay so wow ah sorry sorry nu respect to mu okay so this is slightly better so so if you write the nu equal to f times mu, and s of f mu with respect to mu is integration f log f d mu. Okay? So this is standard <coughs> definition of entropy. And entropy is always positive. So this is an exercise. <coughs> and now the reason <coughs> then there's a log over inequality. So log solver inequality tell you that <coughs> uh, the following. So, who? Log solver inequality. <coughs> the log solver inequality. Oh, let, let me state a theorem. This theorem is uh, due to Bakri and Emery. <coughs> So if you measure mu, it's e to the minus h. Okay. And then the s of f is less than two over k d of square root of f. If if uh, the hashing of h is bigger than k. <coughs> so this is the. <coughs> The the Becquerel-Emery theorem. 
And, and furthermore, uh, furthermore, so if you solve the equation DTF equal to LFT, then this will imply that uh, the S of FT is less than exponential minus 2T times K of S F of 0. And the Dirichlet form of square root F of T is less than 2 over T e to the minus TK of S of F of 0. I think th this one is. So in other words, so, so this implies the entropy is exponentially decay with rate, with time to equilibrium one over k. So that's the idea. <coughs> now, um, this Bakri Emery theorem says uh, it's a uh, this is actually the it's equivalent to the geometry theorem. If you if you study the differential geometry, it's uh, differential geometry you will say the Ricci curvature is positive, then you have a spectral gap, and uh, you have a heat kernel estimate. And here says the you have log sober inequality. If you uh, if your Hamiltonian edge is strictly convex. And this uh, strictly convexity give you the inverse to the time to the equilibrium. So, um, and if you look at the proof, uh, this, you know, both proof, uh, actually the, the proof and this uh, Peter Lee and Yao's proof of heat kernel estimate has some similarities, and, but uh, it's not exactly the same, but because actually differential geometry is proof, the, the Lee and Yao proof is much more complicated because they got the point-wise estimate, and here is uh, in terms of entropy and, uh, and dirge form. I think the important thing is that this gives you the time to equilibrium is 1 over k. And, and it's, it's quite obvious. What it says is uh, if, you, if you think about your, if you think about uh, a Hamiltonian like this, and then the, ti the time to equilibrium, if you, this become this become bigger and bigger, then it takes longer and longer time to reach equilibrium. And if it becomes smaller and smaller, it becomes shorter and shorter. So that's why it's 1 over k. So, so this, uh, this theorem, uh, you know, I have a, um, you know, I have a, I, w I went through this proof about 10 times in my life already. So, but uh, it's actually, um, it's tried to, uh, try to see, um, try to, I mean, try to look at this proof. It's actually a very, it's very important argument. And, you know, I, I learned this, uh, I remember I learned this from Varda, and he, he, he told me that this theorem is correct. And then, then he, start, he started to differentiate. So let me give you the hint at the time he gave me, and then you should try to do finish the rest. So if you differentiate the entropy, then you will find this is exactly the rich form, up to a constant. OK? And so this idea. And the idea is then you take a derivative of entropy. So then the idea is you don't put this minus negative something depending on the entropy again. And then there's, uh, there's some number here. I think it's k or 1 over k. I forgot. Uh, maybe it's k here. Okay. So you combine these two inequality, then you can prove this and this. And then you integrate this one, you will get this Bakery Emery inequality. So, so the whole proof is, is dynamic. You see, this theorem, as it is, this, the, the, this inequality here, there's no time at all. But the way to prove such an inequality with no time is to go through an argument depending on time. And uh, the hint is these two inequalities. So, so you can try to finish it. I, 
uh, it took me uh, a day or two to, to complete the argument. It's uh, at a time, so it, so details in the is in the page seventy four of my. Uh, Sorry, I can't hear you. A two over T? Yeah. Well, I, I, I forgot exactly how, how do we get it. But uh, anyway, don't worry about it. You, you should check. I forgot exactly where it's come from. But because the, the interest is for large T. For large T, the, anyway, this is a main term. Okay. So, OK. So now, uh, so now we want to apply this bakri emery argument to uh, and so now, what is our Hamiltonian? Our Hamiltonian, our Hamiltonian is actually we. What we have is e to the n to uh, e to the n h, and uh, we have this here, and h is this. So, so if you compute the Hessian of h, it computes a quadratic form. So this quadratic form, because this term, lambda j squared over 4, so quadratic form is summation over v j squared over 4 uh, plus. Now here, this uh, log lambda j minus lambda, lambda i. So if you compute a hash in here, you differentiate i and differentiate j, and then you times the v i v j. So at the end, this will become lambda i minus lambda j square times v i minus v j square. Okay, so this is a quadratic form. So let me check. Um, just want to make sure it's correct. I think it's well, it's, it's correct. So mm -hmm. well, the way it goes. Well, okay. Anyway, I think it's correct. Anyway, you can just compute. I mean, I may make some error of, uh, oh, I see, there's one over n. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes, there's one over n, I forgot. OK, so you get that. But don't forget there's another n here. There's another n. So, uh, all right. So this tell you that uh, uh, this tell you uh, mm, this tell you that you get this log solver inequality and. Uh, uh, Yes. So this, you know, in particular, this is bigger than constant. This is bigger than one quarter. Uh, no, I forgot one quarter, one half. That's all. Well, okay. So let me uh, hash in, uh, this is one half. So, one half. so this is bigger than one half. V square. This is L two norm square. Okay. Uh, so. Just a second. Um, yes? And then, um, so what is our dynamics? How is our Dirichlet form? So now, let me put back all the n. Our Dirichlet form is, uh, is 1 over n. So I mentioned i. Gradient f i f square d mu. Okay, so there's a slightly there's a slightly change there's a small difference here. I divide by one over n, and uh, this mu is e to the minus n h. And here I state a general theorem. This Bakri emery I state a general theorem. There's no n here. There's no n here, and there's no the Dirichlet form. Oh, sorry, the Dirichlet form again. Um, here, the Dirichlet form of a function g 
is integration gradient g squared d mu. So there's no, there's no factor n here in the Bakri Emery theorem. So the Bakri Emery theorem is a general theorem, has no, no specific reference to the number of particles. But here in our definition, I, I put an n here and divide by, and I also divide by n here. But this n and this n will cancel each other. So from here, so from this Bakri Emery, this implies that the entropy of F is less than constant times the rich form of square root F. And this implies the time to equilibrium. Is all the what? Okay. Now, uh, so time to equilibrium is order one. Oh. But the Dyson's conjecture is time to local equilibrium is order one over n. Okay, so so there's a gap. So um, so so the question is uh, time to equilibrium is order one, and to local equilibrium is one over n. Uh, and uh, so why? How do you answer this question? Now, uh, if you work on fluid mechanics, you know that in fluid mechanics, fluid mechanics, there are always, uh, you know, there, there's some, some, some wave. And, uh, and you also do the frequency decomposition. There are also some fast oscillations, right? So typically, the fast oscillation will, will, will relax much faster than the big wave. So this means that uh, the local fluctuation will go to equilibrium much faster than the global equilibrium. So log sober inequality tell you the approach to global equilibrium is all the one, but this is, uh, this is not enough. And so, so you, want to, um, you want to see that how do you, how do you solve, answer the question that time to local equilibrium is all the one over n. And this is a key question, this, uh, how, do, how do you um, answer this question? Okay, so uh, so let me state the the main result here. It's um, Ethereum twelve point four. Uh, maybe I stay here. Or oh, any question here? There's an order. That's right. It, it does not cross. Uh, it, it will not cross if beta is bigger than equal to 1. They will not cross because, because actually beta equal to 1 is equivalent to, uh, to two dimension Brownian motion. To beta equal to 1 is uh, the dynamics of beta equal to 1. If you look at the gap, if you look at the gap, the distance of the gap, and you forget about, forget about every other particle, then, then the gap satisfies the radial process of two-dimension Brownian motion. So the probability you will hit this point is zero. The two-dimension Brownian motion you will hit the origin is probably zero, so you will not cross. And uh, th this can be, can be proved. And so everything we are talking about, actually this is also a fine detail. Is this bacteria Emery theorem? Actually, in principle, this everything has to be smooth, and so we are applying this theorem to the to the simplex because you have a lambda one. Let's say you go lambda two. Let's say. So you apply the theorem to the simplex, and uh, it's actually uh, they are they are very you know they are serious technical questions because because. Uh, uh, that you have to worry about the derivative at the point lambda one equal to lambda two, and whether you can do integration bypass in the right way, and so there are quite a lot of details. But uh, but anyway, it works at the end. So, but it's, it's actually it's important that you will not cross, 
if he cross, then, uh, well, of course. So. so. So here's the main idea. So this is so-called a local. Uh, I try to try to stay this. Uh, what's the name? Um, I don't know how, how do I call this name. I changed the name several times, so now I forget about the name. Um, a local relaxation measure. This is a, a it's somehow a little bit crazy idea. So if you define a measure mu tilde, it's equal to, um, oh, I call it omega. Okay, I call it omega. Omega. It's equal to uh, to omega x dx, and uh, omega x is equal to e to the minus uh, n h tilde divided by z tilde, and h tilde is equal to original h plus w, and the w is equal to 1 over 2 tau xj minus gamma j square. Okay. So uh, gamma j is the classical location Remember that gamma j is defined by, by this formula. This, this is uh, j over n, and this is gamma j. Okay. And then, so the idea, so so this this xj xj is lambda j. So, XJ. so so you change your measure. So in the beginning, our equilibrium measure, invariant measure, is d mu is e to the This is d mu. So now I take a measure, which is is different from the invariant measure. I change this one by add a convex, by add a new potential, which is which is convex, and tau will be small. So so why do I do that? Because the Hessian of H tilde will be bigger than one over tau. And now because tau is much, much smaller than one, so this is much, much bigger than one. At the end, at the end, our goal is to choose tau. It's almost n to the minus one plus epsilon. So this is the goal. Okay, so I, I, so I choose a measure, which I completely change the invariant measure to a new one. And this new one has a, has, a, has a beta convexity by adding this term. And now, uh, so, the, so the theorem says the following theorem. It says uh, uh, for any t bigger than tau times n to the epsilon, the entropy of GT uh, of FT of mu with respect to omega is less than constant m square times Q times tau inverse. And uh, Q is equal to, um, where is the Q? Okay. Q is equal to summation uh, so, so I may, I, I, I go back to lambda j. I don't want maybe it's a bad idea to use gamma j lambda xj. Okay, and the one of n. 
<coughs> now, so the theorem says, suppose, suppose your equation like this. Then, and q equal to that. And furthermore, if I define, um, I, I, will, I will explain what's the meaning of this. If I define the, if I let uh, ft, oh, the ft of uh, of mu plus the gt of omega, then the rich form square gt respect to omega is less than constant as n square q tau minus two. So this is the key key estimate. Uh, so let me, let me try to explain this. So, so usually, you always control the, the entropy with respect to equilibrium measure. You also compute the rich form with respect to equilibrium measure. Now, but then the equilibrium measures, if you look at this, the equilibrium measure has time, uh, time to equilibrium order one, which I just, it's order one. So now, so then this means uh, we cannot use this, uh, this bakery emery's argument. So the idea was, uh, now if I change the measure to a different one, this one, makes, this one is much more convex because I add this term to make it artificially convex. But on the other hand, because I change the measure, so, so then, then the original estimate of bakery emery is incorrect, but on the other hand, I still know that the entropy at time t, as long as t is bigger than tau times n to the epsilon, is controlled by n squared times q times tau inverse. And what is the q? q is the, is the distance between lambda j and the gamma j. Uh, taking the expectation with respect to the ft of lambda mu d lambda. And then you also get the uh, estimate of the rich form. But anyway, this one, you, uh, this one is, uh, this is a secondary, but this one will be the important one. So, that I, so what it means is that if you know the lambda j is close to gamma j, then you will know that the entropy of your ft of mu and the omega are very close. So, um, so this is something, uh, this is some, uh, some unusual step because, uh, because instead of compare thing with the equilibrium, this is equilibrium measure. So you don't compare things with equilibrium. You compare things with uh, something which is non-equilibrium, which, uh, which is actually a wrong object. You compare your, um, you, com you look at the entropy between your measure and, and, the, and the probability measure which is wrong. But on the other hand, you can control this as long as you know the Q uh, you know, distance of lambda eigenvalue, lambda j, and classical location is not far from each other. Then you can really control this one. And, uh, and what's the point of this? Because uh, why do you want to estimate this guy? It's because uh, this omega, omega has good convexity. This omega has good convexity is because you get this one. You can get from here. Uh, probably you, you may want to, s to spend, look at this for a few minutes. It's a, this is actually quite, quite strange that you are trying to do this. And then, um, so I will explain that this one and the why um, the, the next, with this one, and why you can conclude the Dyson's conjecture. So I will state, uh, let me make the following statement, so. Yes. Z tilde, or oh, Z tilde is normalization constant. So anytime, anytime I write something like that, because this is probably, I want this to be probability measure. 
So I need to divide, divide it by a constant to make the probability measures. OK. Uh, so oh, by the way, th this idea has never appeared anywhere to, uh, to study a problem by converging to equilibrium by using a, uh, by using a probability measure, which is not in the equilibrium. And, uh, so so this, uh, the real this uh, the following theorem says uh, if, you, if you have a density qd omega equal to 1, and then if you compare the qd omega minus d omega over test functions, uh, q, uh, what g, I call it g, uh, g of n of lambda i minus lambda i plus 1, and so then uh, in summation over i belong to a set j and 1 over the size j, then this is less than the t times the rich form omega of q divided by j square root of t is inside. <coughs> so properly speaking, it's a, <coughs> it says uh, if you, uh, q of t, is so always t, uh, q. Uh, ah, well, plus uh, square root entropy of Q e to the minus C T. Uh, uh, may maybe I think it is slightly more common for so, so let me just just drop this. Let me just put this top. It's just top. Okay. All right. So it is tau. Tau is uh, tau is defined. It's here. How is this? Okay. So this is a so this is a following. So suppose you you want to look at the gap, the gap distribution of eigenvalues summation over i between in the j and j is a subset. J is for example j is a j is a subset. So you take a subset of these, so say, for example, roughly speaking, if you take energy E, and then you can look at all these indices, all these J, okay? So you take uh, the, the gap of eigenvalues, and then you take average over, all, over this gap. You compare the expectation of Q omega and the other one, just the omega, the difference between Q omega and omega. The difference is controlled by the Dirich form of this Q respect to uh, this square root Q. Of the Q, respect to omega, and times tau divided by J. So in other words, in other words, if, if the rich form of square Q omega is small, then this implies that, this implies the gap distribution of omega, uh, Q omega and omega are the same. So that's the idea. <coughs> so roughly speaking, we try our dynamics as in very measure mu. We construct a measure which is completely wrong, and, but the, it has increased the convexity. Now from here, you can control the entropy and the Dirich form. And now once you control, once you have a good control of the Dirich form, and this lemma tell you that uh, if you have two measures, and they, if their density has small Dirich form, then they have the same gap distribution. So this means this gap distribution. So the theorem says, uh, so this will imply that Ft, Ft uh, this gt omega, and the omega has the same gap distribution. So this is the logic. 
uh, and uh, and then you combine these two theorems together, you prove this uh, Dyson's conjecture about the time to equilibrium. But our original theorem is to prove this weakness. Weakness theorem. Weakness theorem has no has no Brownian motion at all. So I have. So there, there's still one one more thing I should say. Uh, but uh, I know the time is up, so I just take two minutes. So in the beginning, we have a weakness matrix H. And then here has a, has a Gaussian. And you want to say the eigenvalue of this one and this one are close to each other. So what we prove now is if I take an edge and I add, add, the, add the A, and this is a Gaussian. And then I know that after I make some small perturbation, then the eigenvalue of this one and this one are close to each other. They are close to each other. But our original problem is that this and these are close to each other. So there's still something missing. Because uh, when I run by Dyson Brownian motion, I, I forgot to say, when you run by Dyson Brownian motion, it's the same as uh, you take original magic but add a Gaussian piece. So you add a Gaussian piece, and then you said you add this one, this one, this, this and this is the same eigenvalue distribution. But this does not mean the original edge has the same eigenvalue distribution as this guy. So, so this is a bit like. Uh, you are you are only you are you are you are using a flow argument, and your flow argument at time t were close to your solution, and this is what you want. But you are interested in your your, your time equal zero that it has to give the same eigenvalue distribution as the Gaussian case. Uh, see, this, whenever you you run the in differential geometry you run the flow argument, you want to say the time goes to infinity. You flow to something you try to prove. But now, now the time at infinity in this problem is a, is a Gaussian. It's, it's, it's completely trivial. But so now what you know is that if you run the dynamic for some small time, for some short time, you will go to it's already reached the equilibrium at the infinity. But your question is that you want to, what the question you want to study is at time t equals zero. Your initial data. So, so how can you study? Uh, how can you study the initial data? By running the dynamics, this is the opposite of what you thought about the, the the flow argument. And so, so next time I will explain the idea. Uh, of, of course, I will go through a little bit some of this detail, and also explain the idea why why you can study the flow arg why you can use a flow argument to get the initial data is already is correct, because this sounds contradictory. I mean, I don't know if you catch the the logic problem. Because, you see, uh, okay, so, so you want to say that you want to say that h zero, this is initial data, the eigenvalue distribution of this one, and the h infinity, this is Gaussian. You want to say the eigenvalue of this one, and this one are the same, okay? So what you do is uh, go to time h t, okay? Then you prove that at the time h t, then this. Uh, then they, they are the same. So this is this uh, Dyson Brownian motion argument by running the flow. So this and this are the same. But then you want to say that this one and this one are the same. But but then this sounds very strange because if I can prove this one and this one are the same, but then why not I just directly prove this and this are the same? Why? What's the difference? And also there's a logic question of uh, you know in all this argument based on this Bakri Emery argument, actually the initial data do not really matter. Because when you show that it, it converges to equilibrium in a very strong sense, the initial data it doesn't really matter. It will, the dynamics will force you to equilibrium. So this means that you use almost not very much information of this guy. So, so logically, there is a problem of how do you answer this initial data question problem. But then we will explain that actually you can do something to say that actually initial layer you can. I mean, there are some way to almost go backward in time. Say this and this guy are the same. And then this will finish the proof of here and here are the same. So, um, so this is, I will do this next time. Uh, if, if you, if you still have patience to follow, okay? All right, I'll stop here.